let's hop right into it as promised this is a follow-up from our workshop yesterday we are looking at the rhetorical analysis essay and of course this is workshop number one so i want to start off by telling you guys that it's really important that you check for feedback so that's what your responsibility is as a student you want to make sure that with every blackboard post that you write for every discussion board and for every essay that you submit that you go back and you check for feedback now most times this will be located in the my grade section you'll click feedback or whatever is there in hyperlink in blue and it should show you exactly what i said but for those of you who have posted items inside of the discussion board at times this is not for everyone at times i do respond to you and I even upload at times feedback to you so check there and if you don't have it it's no worries it's not mandatory but it is important for those of you when I leave feedback for you it's important that you read it so what we're going to do for today we're going to make sure that we look at the top 10 mistakes that students make on this essay now I've had a chance to look at some of your work thus far I've had a chance to survey some of your outlines and I've noticed these top 10 mistakes already so please listen up this will answer your questions about what the paragraph should look like what the intro should should look like. I'm going to try to give you a good overview of all of the things that should be in your essay and I'm going to try and steer you clear of the things that often happen when students make mistakes with their essay. Let's start at number 10. Okay, strategy is lacking. Now what does this mean? This means that students oftentimes approach their paper with no mental strategy of just how all the moving parts are going to come together. So they end up with what we call an incongruent paper. That means the top of the paper, the first essay, or the first paragraph or the introduction is strong. They set out on a course to do certain things within the essay, but they don't follow through. Sometimes the quite opposite happens. Sometimes the beginning of the essay is sort of weak. And then later on in the essay, the writer gets stronger and more confident and they're able to assert their position more, but they forget to go back into the introduction and update their thesis statement and introduction. You want to come in with a strategy. This means that you're going to organize your paper according to what's most important to least important or chronologically or in order of arguments. OK, so that means that you have to think about what makes the most sense in terms of your organization of your ideas. Now, whatever is listed inside of your thesis statement, that X, Y and Z or one, two, three, whatever is there must follow or correspond within your body paragraphs. This is one way that you can keep yourself on point because this produces a blueprint for you as the writer. It's like telling someone that you're an architect and that you're building a building, right? And as you're building this building, you don't follow the guidelines you set for yourself as you built it. So level one is not on level one. Somehow what was supposed to be on level one is on level 10. Now you can understand why that's a bit confusing. So I challenge students to make sure that they have a strategy and strategies may differ, but for the most part, every single student needs to make sure that whatever's listed in their one, two, and three must correspond with body paragraph number one, body paragraph number two, and body paragraph number three. Here's a sample formula for a thesis. And remember, the thesis statement is the blueprint for the essay. It's like the menu when you go to a restaurant and you look at the menu and you say, you know what? I want to make this order. I want a steak with mashed potatoes, okay, and string beans. Now, what's listed in that order is exactly what the waiter or waitress is going to present to you. If the waitress or the waiter comes back and you do not have a steak, instead you have pizza, that will be a problem. Your thesis statement basically tells your reader exactly what will be on the menu exactly what kind of dish you'll be eating as you read the essay. So if you tell the reader that in body paragraph number one, your writer successfully convinces the reader by relying on his expert opinion to build credibility, that should appear in the very first paragraph, okay? That's your stake. Secondly, you told your writer, your reader, that you're gonna show them how the writer narrated events to grip the audience's emotions. That's an emotional appeal. That should appear in your body paragraph number two. This keeps you on track and makes sure that you yourself follow back up with your blueprint. 
and make sure that you stay on topic and that you provide logical evidence and reasoning for each one of your points. You won't start off with ethical appeal and then somehow start talking about ethical appeals in paragraph number two. You won't want to talk about logical appeals and then somehow that argument becomes an argument more about emotional appeals. No, you're going to make sure that you section off and compartmentalize each one of your sections according to the topic. So each paper should have an intuitive blueprint that each writer develops for themselves. But one of the most strategic ways you can do this is by making sure that it is in the thesis statement. So there you have an example of a formula is in author's name, let's use John Lewis. In John Lewis's text, okay, or in John Lewis's commencement address, okay, 2018 commencement address, the rhetorical power of the text compels the reader to, and then the main idea, to get into trouble. If you read John Lewis's speech, it's about getting into trouble. So in John Lewis's speech in 2019, his 2019 a commencement speech um, to City College, the rhetorical power of his speech compels the reader or the audience to get into trouble. That would be in quotation marks because it comes directly from the speech. Lewis successfully convinces the reader. Okay, now this is where our guiding question comes in. Lewis successfully convinces the reader by one, two, and three. One, relying on his expert opinion to build credibility. Two, narrating events to grip audience emotions, and three, organizing the facts to provide well-informed solutions. Again, it is important that you have this kind of structure. You may not have one, two, and three there, but you may separate your ideas with a comma. You may separate it with A, B, or C. There are a number of ways you can separate these three ideas, but what's most important is that you have a main idea for how this piece, this speech or text, how this speech or text had rhetorical strategies that successfully brought the reader to their side or did not do so. So that is why you must have a layout for your essay. If you don't, you will be one of those people who make this mistake where your strategy is lacking and you end up missing one of the three rhetorical strategies and you will not have an A paper. Let's look a little deeper at number nine. No timeline for the project. Okay, so we talked about this in class very briefly. A lot of people don't realize that your paper can be underdeveloped. Lack of time management skills means that you want to cook something. Like let's say, you, let's just go back to the metaphor with the, di the dishes and the meals. Let's say you want to cook um, a turkey, but you want to make that turkey in one hour or 30 minutes, right? We know a good turkey doesn't take an hour to bake. It takes a bit longer than that. It has to be in the oven. It has some pre-cooking. It has to go through some phases. It has to go through some defrosting phases. So a lot of times students end up finalizing their paper, but it's not yet developed, right? It's still in a def defrosting mode. Or better yet, once it comes out of the oven, it's brown on the outside, but it's frozen on the inside, meaning you did not take enough time to develop your idea. Every good idea requires a certain amount of actual time, reflection, and thinking to develop it. I know how to spot a paper that has great ideas that just were not developed. Okay, so this means that you need to manage your time for the project. Okay, can you think of a project that could have been more successful further in its development if the writer had just taken more time? Do not rush and do not leave your paper underdeveloped. Revelations that shall endure the test of time also require more time to fully mature. Again, so if you want a revelation on an idea, you want a, a, a concept, you want to deliver on your, your truth or what you saw, your assertion, you want to make sure that that thing endures the test of time. Well, that means it will need more time to fully mature. So that means that for every project that we have, you already know the timeline. Use your time wisely. Number eight. Turn the essay into the summer into a summary. Okay, so this is a mistake that students made. Obviously, your essay is not a summary. You're not assigned to write a summary. The title of the assignment is not summary. The title of this essay is called the rhetorical analysis essay. So it means that you shall not be writing a report or a summary of the things that happen in the text. The reader does not need to read your summary. We can all go on Spark Notes to read summaries of what we're talking about in class. 
Okay, the reader can read the paper for themselves to summarize it. You have to make a brief summary in your introduction before making your claim. That is essential. However, students who make the mistake of simply summarizing what the author said, they fail to complete the assignment. And we all know that good writing fits the context, meaning it's within the right assignment, within the right realm. If all you do is summarize, you're not even on the right assignment. You're not in the right realm. You're not in the right discussion or dialogue. You're outside of it. And there's no way you can get a passing grade if you're not talking about the same things we're talking about. Make sure that you do not turn this essay into a summary. Make sure that you have a valid claim, okay? Make sure, and this is number seven, make sure that you actually have something to say. Now, this goes back once again to our guiding question for this essay. I gave you a guiding question. Most essays do not come with them, okay? The guiding question here is, did the author effectively convince the readers to come to his or her side? And then how? Using what rhetorical strategies? That means that you have to then answer that question. Your essay's goal is to answer that question. Thus, your essay's goal is not to provide a summary. It's not to provide your opinions on the topics. It is to reflect and make an assessment of the rhetorical strategies presented within your chosen text. So your reflection assignment, why we write, was so important because it did not ask you to summarize. It asks you to discover why you are writing about the essay you have chosen. This is important because this allows you to reflect on what's important to you. This means that you have to explore your own thoughts on the essay or the text, and you have to think about what brings you to that page, what made you select that one, and what are the things that you want to say about it. What are your goals in revealing the rhetorical strategies of that text? Why did you choose Dr. King's um, Letters from Birmingham Jail or Gloria Anzaldua's How to Tame a Wild Tongue? Okay, why did you why were you so attracted to Mario Cuomo's speech? Okay. Think about those things and what you actually have to say about the effectiveness of their rhetoric. What could it be that you were really um convinced by what they said? Could it be that you were really offended by what they said? Or could it be that you thought that their rhetoric lacked something and that they were not actually using ethical appeals correctly or that their logic was lacking or that they used way too many emotional appeals? Whatever the reason is, you want to know it so that you know what you have to say. You know that this and this this the meaning of your paper is not just about the summary it's not just about the topic you are drawn to this text to reveal something about it and so it's very important that you actually have something to say we call this the so what right every paper has a so what at the end what does it all mean what does it mean if they had great logical appeals or great ethical appeals what does that mean you have to reflect on this and you have to think about it. And this typically happens within the brainstorming process, but it's key in the writing and drafting stage. OK, find what you have to say in the drafting stage, write and rewrite and find if you can back up what you're saying from within the text. Organize your structure and your form so that what you say makes sense and that is organized in the proper manner and the reader will be able to understand it and flow with what you're saying. OK, so again, you have to have something to say. A big mistake that students make, they actually have nothing to say. They're just writing a report. And this is not a report. This is an analysis, meaning that, again, we are looking at all the parts of the, the Texas rhetoric. And the valuable parts to us right now are path, pathos, logos and ethos. So we got to look at how those things are um, being used within the text, how the author is moving those things around to influence the reader. That is our task, okay? So again, the guiding question that you must answer in your paper, this must be in your thesis statement. This is what's going to guide the entire paper. Ask yourself as you reread and reread and reread your text, ask yourself, has the author effectively convinced me? How have they done that or failed to do that? How have they done that using the rhetorical strategies? Okay. How have they used logical appeals? Which ones did they use to effectively convince me? Which, which emotional appeals did they use? And we have a whole worksheet, okay, and print out on the kinds of rhetorical strategies that exist, the kinds of logical appeals that you might run into. 
So you have to identify those. And then you have to assert whether or not those were quality appeals that effectively convinced you as the reader. That is your assignment. Anything less than that is off topic. Okay. And then, of course, a lot of times students fail to test their claims. So we might say that, you know, there were a lot of logical appeals in William Faulkner's speech, and yet the, the claims are not tested. When you actually test what someone's considering and what they're saying existed in, in, in that work, you find that it, it does not add up. So make sure that you research, okay? Research what you're actually saying. Think about what you're actually saying and think about whether or not it can be disproved, easily disproved, okay? Let's think about an example from Thomas Jefferson's um, works because he was one of the main writers of the Constitution of the United States. Let's think about um, his rhetorical appeals in that text. If someone were to say that Thomas Jefferson's rhetorical appeals were purely logical, I think we would have to test that claim. Th that claim insinuates that there were no other kinds of rhetorical appeals within his text. However, we can find evidence of Jefferson's appeals to people's emotions. So there might be emotional appeals there, which means that the previous statement is incorrect. It can easily be disproved just by finding a single emotional appeal. So we must be people who test our claims. Your first thought is not always the most accurate one. The first example that you pull from the text as an example of a rhetorical appeal may not be the best one. So I challenge you to look and keep looking. Look for the strongest claim, okay? So there are claims that range from very weak to very strong. A lot of you guys will talk about language and tone. I guarantee you in these texts that you have, have, have read, there are stronger examples of emotional appeals than language and tone. Okay, look deeper. Number five, one of the common mistakes that students make, thesis does not simply restate facts, it asserts something new. So what students do is they just restate the facts. They restate all of the facts that were in the, in the original text. They do not assert anything new. So essentially what they're doing is they're writing a report. The reader does not need to reread facts. They too can surmise from the text. Your perspective is what is powerful, your perspective. What are your perspective? What is your perspective of those facts or things said within the text? What do you, and you will not use the word I, what do you think make th makes the text powerful convincing, worth reading? What strategies made that text worth reading? Now, you have to see the examples that we've posted online and that we'll go through in class, but you yourself need to develop ideas that are original. That means that when you look at something that's within the text, you're not going to restate something that is generic. A lot of you guys have thesis statements that say, Martin Luther King used ethos, pathos, and logos in his essay. That is very unoriginal. That can even be said about anything in the earth. Any piece of writing can be said to have used a pathos, logos, and ethos. You've not gone specific enough and you've not asserted something new. Look at the text and pull out something that maybe other people didn't pick up on. How did Dr. King use the ethical appeal in a unique way? Think about that. Think about how he used emotional appeals, okay, how he used personal narratives or touching commentary from his children, okay? Talk about the dialogue and the language that he used that triggered his audience's emotions. Talk about his use of rebuttals, okay, and his use of different variations of text to counteract the things that his critics were saying. Did we call this intertextuality? From a prison cell, Dr. King was using the words of Aristotle, the Apostle Paul, and Henry David Thoreau. That has to mean something in terms of logic. It's your task and your job to identify something that has not been apparent or is not generic, okay? Which cannot be said about just any random old work. Something unique. So don't just say they use pathos, logos, and ethos. Those words are banned from your paper. Get more specific. Let's talk about personal anecdotes. Let's talk about emotionally laden vocabulary, descriptive imagery, okay? For logical appeals, let's talk about facts, statistics, historical data. Let's talk about arguments and things of that nature. For ethical appeals, let's talk about credibility or the lack thereof. 
Let's talk about morals and appealing to the morals of his audience. Those are the things that you need to be specific about. And those are the things that will help you assert something new. Now, I've already sort of gone into this one, but the fourth thing that students tend to do, thesis is too generic. Dr. King uses ethos, pathos, and logos in his essay. That is far too generic. Many students make the mistake of making their thesis too basic or generic. It can apply to nearly anything. They fail to highlight specific points of interest. Claims must be interesting and thought-provoking, not ones that have been uh, made a million times across millions of essays. Writers are speaking in new contexts to unique authors, leveling diverse um, audiences. Okay, there is constantly new information in every new writing because of the changing times that define them. And most importantly, because of you, you are the person whose perspective and lens animates everything the reader will read. It's you who makes this piece different. Okay, with that, take your time to develop original and specific ideas. We'll go through examples in class. So let's look at some examples okay, of what not to do and what we should do. So a thesis that's a bit too generic is, in his 2019 commencement address, John Lewis successfully convinced his students to do something more with their lives. Okay, that's too generic, and it also doesn't speak specifically to any rhetorical strategies that he used. Let's look at the next one. It talks about rhetorical strategies, but it has something that's missing. John Lewis's speech captivates the audience and convinces them to come to his side using emotions, credibility, and logic. Well, that's a step up. That's a lot better. But let's be more specific. How many pieces of writing use emotions, credibility, and logic to convince their readers? We have to pull things that are specific and unique to John Lewis's way of using emotional appeals, of talking about his own credibility, and using logic to convince his audience. The words that were chosen in that second one are a bit too broad. Emotions? What can be said about emotions? a lot of things. Credibility? What do you mean about credibility? Let's get more specific. There are unique ways that each writer utilized all of the rhetorical strategies that we see. We have to know that what makes them unique and different has to be in the thesis because that is what we are asserting. That's what made them stand out. So what is your perspective on the writing? What about the emotional appeal made it stand out? Let's look at that third one. Using a combination of rhetorical strategies, namely ethical and emotional appeals, Lewis convinces his audience to become active participants in fighting for justice. So here it answers that first part of the guiding question. Does the author convince the reader of his to come to his or her side? Yes, he does convince his audience to do what? To become active participants in fighting for justice. But then it gets more specific because, again, the guiding question asks us how using what specific rhetorical strategies. So the guiding question is flipped here, okay? The words from the guiding question are used in the answer. More specifically, Lewis employs his credibility as an activist. So not just any kind of credibility, but his credibility as an activist. Can this be said about everyone? No, it's specific to Lewis's speech. Number two, detailed historical and political facts. Can this be said about everyone? No. Gloria and Zaldua did not necessarily detail historical and political facts, okay? Chadwick Boseman did not necessarily have historical and political facts. These were unique to John Lewis's speech. And again, we're going to see that the following body paragraphs correspond with these particular claims that were made in the thesis. So the first body paragraph will have to be about credibility as an activist. The second body paragraph will have to be about detailed historical and political facts, which is a logical appeal. And the third body paragraph will have to be about what? Personal narratives of the pains of injustice. Now, is this unique to John Lewis? Not in all the world, but in this particular speech, he does use this rhetorical strategy to appeal to his audience's emotions. Okay, he talks about personal pains of injustice, how he was raised in Alabama. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere, all of which compels the audience to receive his logic. Bada boom, bada bang. We have three clear ways that the writer used rhetorical strategies to convince his audience to come to his side. 
That is what is necessary. Do your assessment. And I will say this, not all of the essays have to convince you. You can argue that they did not convince you or that they lacked um, rhetorical um, prowess in a specific area. Okay, you can make that argument. But again, whatever argument you make must be backed up with evidence from the text. Let's look at number three. This is a common mistake. We're down to number three now. This means that these are the mistakes that occur more often than not. More often than not, students may not even have a thesis statement. More often than not, students skip that entirely. They have no main idea for their text. And again, they've reduced the text to a summary. Without a thesis statement, I want you guys to hear me loud and clear, you will fail that assignment. There is no way to even grade your paper. You need a thesis statement. So what are the formulas that we have? We're going to go through these in class, and I'm giving you feedback on the thesis statements that you've presented. But you're going to look at your thesis statement and make sure that it has these qualifications. It's one to two sentences in your introduction, okay? Most likely at the end of your introduction, which highlights the main claim of your paper. Now, why did I bold and highlight? The reason is because you do not have to give all the information OK, in that first paragraph, you don't have to tell the reader every single point from beginning to end, but you're going to highlight. Now, when I say highlight, I don't mean that you simply say emotions, credibility and logic, but I mean that you do give the reader just enough so that they can understand the entirety of your argument. So he convinces his audience OK, using credibility as an activist. So that doesn't tell us everything we want to know. The body paragraph is going to give us more detail and more evidence. So save the evidence for your body paragraph and highlight the main idea in your thesis statement. So again, highlight in the thesis statement. It has to be specific, but it does not have to have any evidence. Don't start saying because, because, because. If you start to use those words in your introduction, you are overstepping the, what the actual purpose of an introduction, introduction is, which is to introduce you to the ideas that will be presented in the essay. So introduce the ideas, highlight the main claims of your paper, okay? Make sure that you have those three strong ways that that main claim will be supported. Here, the main claim is that first part of the guiding question. Lewis convinces his audience to become active participants in fighting for justice. So he does convince them, okay, how? We always need that how in three ways. And we have them in that previous thesis statement. So here is a sample formula for you. You do not have to use this, but it is wise if you want to flesh your ideas out and make sure that you have checked off everything that is required for a thesis statement. Okay, now let's look at, a, a way that we can figure this out. How can we figure this out? Let's use this text as a sample. Now you may be familiar with this. This is a dialogue from the classic, The Lion King, okay? Scar says, Simba, what have you done? Okay, Simba jumps back crying. He says, there were wildebeest and he tried to save me. It, it was an accident. I, I didn't mean for it to happen. Scar, embracing Simba, you're still distant. Of course, of course you didn't. No one ever means, and he pulls Simba closer. Simba hides his face on Scar's foreleg. No one ever means for these things to happen. But the king is dead, looking with mock regret at Simba. And if it weren't for you, he'd still be alive. Simba is crushed, believing his guilt. Another thought occurs to Scar. Oh, what will your mother think? Simba sniffing. What am I going to do? Scar says, run away, Simba, run. Run away and never return. Simba runs off blindly, obviously broken. Slight pause for the audience to catch his emotional breath. Music ends. The three hyenas appear behind Scar. Scar says, kill him. Okay, so why, why this fear? Why all the drama? If you've seen Lion King, you know that this is the part where Mufasa has died. Simba's father has died. The pride, the joy of their kingdom is gone. And there is this rhetorical scene, okay? There's this huge rhetorical situation happening. We have a context. We have an audience. We have someone who's delivering a very convincing rhetorical strategy. And that person is Scar. 
Okay, so Scar is actually using quite a few rhetorical strategies. He has an emotional appeal, okay, to Simba. All right. He has even, if you think about it, ethical appeal, right? We're going to talk about that. And he even has what we call a logical appeal. So he's twisting logic to get his his listener, his audience to believe him and to do what he wants them to do. So he's using rhetorical appeals in this particular um, excerpt of The Lion King. So let's see how we would turn that into a thesis statement. Okay, we have a text. We have an author, we have an, uh, or a rhetorician, a speaker who effectively convinces. So we have to ask ourselves, did Scar effectively convince Simba, okay, to come to his side, to agree with him or to do what he wanted him to do? Did he effectively influence his audience? Okay, that's the first thing that our thesis statement has to answer. And then we have to ask, okay, how did he do that? Using what rhetorical strategies? Okay, now. Let's think about it. So we have a text. Let's input that. In Disney's classic, The Lion King, that's our text. The author, or here we're going to say rhetorician, the the speaker, Scar, deceivingly convinces Simba. So, okay, we didn't stick with the effectively convinces. We said deceivingly convinces. Why? Because Scar deceives Simba. He deceivingly convinces Simba that he is to blame for his father's death. Notice how we had the message here. Okay, so this is the main idea. He convinced him that he was to blame for his father's death. Now, how did he do it? How did he do that? Playing on the context of Mufasa's death, Scar's key rhetorical strategies rely on his credibility as as Mufasa's brother. Okay, so he used an ethical appeal. He relied on his credibility as Mufasa's brother. Secondly, okay, he manipulates Simba's emotional turbulence. So, okay, he has an emotional appeal. He appeals to Simba's emotions. What does he say specifically? Let's look at the text. Oh, he said, but the king is dead. No one ever means to do things like this. Oh, but what will your mother think? So using language and insinuating things about his mother and saying that he'd still be alive if it weren't for you. Oh, the king is dead. Okay, these things seem to be using emotionally laden language. He's painting a picture here using these words. That is an evidence of emotional appeals. Okay, so what first thing he does, he relies on his credibility as Mufasa's brother. So we never suspect him as the one who has coordinated this whole thing. Secondly, he manipulates Simba's emotional turbulence. And third, he inserts what we call circular logic to compel Simba to abdicate the throne. So he uses circular logic. He says, what will your mother think? He said, okay, if it weren't for you, he'd still be alive. Now, is it really... Simba's fault that his father is, is 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 gone. Aren't there some other things that happened? Some other things that took place. Is it entirely the fault? Would you say it's the fault of Simba? But no, this is a child and he's toying with his mind. He's playing with language and he inserts some logical things that a child doesn't have the rhetorical prowess to dismiss or give a rebuttal for. So we see the use of logical appeals. He appeals to his logic by suggesting deceivingly that if it weren't for him his father would still be alive and then he tells him to run away and never return so this is where we can say that yes Simba did get he was convinced he was influenced by whatever was happening he was convinced by the rhetoric that Scar used okay so he inserts circular logic to compel Simba to abdicate the throne each body paragraph will talk about the things written here. The first body paragraph will talk about the strategy of Mufasa's brother, the credibility that he had as Mufasa's brother. The second strategy will talk about how he manipulated Simba's emotional turbulence. The third strategy will talk about the circular logic he used to compel Simba to abdicate the throne. Again, students who do not have a thesis statement will not have a passing grade on the paper. But your thesis statement can be made okay we can find rhetorical appeals in almost anything we just found it in the classic the lion king okay so what's number two what is number two okay students do not understand the directions can someone say it louder for the people in the back students do not understand the directions 
Students make the mistake of thinking they already know what is being asked of them. They already have motives and cram their preconceived ideas about the assignment into the paper. When the professor reads it, they instantly know who has really thought about the questions at hand and who has not given the instruction much thought. This is what distinguishes students. Okay, we've talked about how important this assignment is, how important it is for you to understand how you're being influenced as an audience member and how you can um, wield the sword of rhetoric, which is the art of persuading, the art of convincing and influence, influencing people with language, how you can wield that power. OK, but you have to understand how people are influenced. And one of the three main strategies happen to be emotionally, logically and ethically. OK, these things are just not things that we've surmised or contrived. They're actually real. And so it's important that you understand these principles, that you do not just do what you want to do with this essay. Make sure you read the directions again and again and make sure that your writing fits the context because good writing fits the context. The context here is the assignment directions. Read them and study them. Understand what you're being taxed with and then Answer it to the best of your ability. Okay, finally, number one. One of the big mistakes that students make, the top mistake is, hmm, students lack the re relevant vocabulary. Students make the mistake of not using key vocabulary offered by the professor. In every guiding question, there are key words that can be used in answering that question. For example, third graders learn to use the flip the question trick. Okay, what does this mean? Okay. It means that when you have a guiding question, you should use the words in the guiding question to provide your thesis, to answer the guiding question. OK, so every prompt that you have for writing has an invisible question, an invisible guiding question, a question that the thesis statement is answering. You may not believe that, but it's essentially true. You're answering a series of questions with every essay. OK, so an example would be if Ben has three apples and Sally has two, how many apples do they have together? No, when you flip this question, you automatically generate the right vocabulary words. What does it mean to flip the question? It means to take the vocabulary of the question to answer the question. This is something we teach our elementary school students. So if Ben has three apples and Sally has two, how many apples do they have together? OK, some people would say as their thesis statement, they have five. Mm -mm. That is not how you would create a thesis statement. You fail to actually incorporate the essential vocabulary. Now, this is a philosophy for thesis statements. Essentially, your thesis statement should be able to be the only sentence that someone reads and they should understand the entirety of your position of your paper. Again, your thesis statement ideally is a statement of one to two sentences that anyone could read and would understand your entire, entire argument. Does they have five actually present the accurate representation of what is being asked and pursued and revealed in that question? It does not, okay? Let's look at the second one. Ben has three and Sally has two. Okay, it does give us some more detail, but if you were just reading Ben has three and Sally has two, would you understand what was being talked about? Apples are not mentioned, okay? The subject is not there, okay? So we need more. Then we have Ben and Sally have five apples together, all together. Now, with just that sentence, we have enough to understand the entire um, thing that is being asked and being answered. It's a full and complete idea. So we want to be very specific about who, what, when, where, and how. Ben and Sally, who have five apples, what, all together, how? You want to be very specific about that. So let's say that you have, okay, the particular question, did the author effectively convince the, the readers to join his or her side? How are you going to flip that question in your thesis statement? The author effectively convinced the readers to join his side. Now, you might not want to say effectively. Maybe you want to say, oh, brazenly, okay, adequately, okay? Genius. They did a genius job of convincing the reader to come to their side. But your your responsibility is to make sure that that question is answered. And then when it's answered, it has to be answered in its fullness. Don't make that answer vague. Anyone should be able to read it. 
outside of the context of your paper and understand the fullness of your argument. So this must be directly answered in your paper, in your thesis statement. Okay, again, what rhetorical strategies were used? Okay, so specifically, the author convinced the reader to come to their side using these rhetorical strategies. Flip the question. The term rhetorical strategies should probably be in your thesis statement, right? Okay, so think about that. That's an elementary way of making sure that your thesis statement is full, all right? I want to reiterate this before I leave you. Your rhetorical analysis paper is not an analysis of what the text says, meaning you're not just discussing the points of the text. You're not telling me what happened. You're not going to talk about injustice and racism per se. You're not just talking about Dr. King and during the 60s, it was a very racial and turbulent time in America. And your whole paper is about that. No, we're talking about rhetorical strategies. Was this convincing and how? You will have an opportunity to talk about the what. You will have an opportunity to talk about the actual topics and to develop your topical essay and argue a point that is for a different kind of essay. Okay, this particular essay is not about that. So it's your job to know that you're not going to just dish out your ideas and commentary on whether or not the subject or the topic and its points were of interest. That's not what an analysis does. So again, it is not an analysis of what the text says, okay? It's not an, a summary of the points in the text. You're not going to summarize the main points of the text. Again, we can read the text for ourselves. You're also not going to critique the text and its main points. All you're doing is looking at the rhetorical strategies, okay? Again, you're not going to argue concerning how right or true the text is. You're going to need to focus on the essential vocabulary, and you're going to make sure that the entire paper is about the rhetorical strategies. The entire paper should be about these rhetorical strategies. Again, that's ethos, okay? And for those of you who have not read the documents that we have online, you have to make sure that you know what ethos actually is and how to identify it, okay? Again, there's pathos. Make sure that you're going into our pathos, logos, and ethos defined document that's in your required reading of your lesson three folder. It details how you can identify um, pathetic appeals or emotional appeals within your text. Usually, you see it in the language, the tone, okay? Usually, but there are ways that the writer uses imagery, colors, sounds, okay? The writer invokes certain emotions of pity, sympathy, anger, happiness, sorrow, courage, or the writer may even evoke certain feelings using a story. It's your task and your job to know that, okay? Now, for logos, things can look a little tricky, but it is your task to know how to identify logos. Sometimes the author's framework of the ideas, okay, is very logical. It's a plan. Um, sometimes they have graphs and data and mediums that reveal um how many things they are talking about and that show the reader why it is logical to come to their side. If you look at Tanahasi Coates' work, if one of the works that is on the list, you will see that he has a number of different mediums, okay, for about reparations. So you guys have to look at even the genre. OK, the genre of Dr. King's letters is a logical approach. He chose a letter for a specific logical reason. It's your task to understand what that is. So I encourage all of you to brainstorm your text once again. Take another look at the essays and the speeches and the videos. OK, you might even want to entertain some friends of yours and ask them what they think. Talk about these ideas with someone. Go into the informal um, discussion board with other students and get to talking about your text. Ask someone what they think about the Dr. King speech and see what fresh new perspectives come out of that. So those are the top 10 mistakes that students make. OK, there are three more. There's 11, 12 and 13. And we will go over that next class. But in the meantime, if you have a question for me, please make sure that you are going to ask the instructor online. As you go there, type a question that all students can benefit from having an answer to. I will provide the answer and the feedback, and I hope that I can see you next class. Have a great day.